and unmute. Yes, go ahead. You were gonna say? You're sporting a new tattoo. No, I've always had this. Oh, you have? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I've had that for like uh, probably 10 years. <laughs> But it only gets seen if I'm wearing, you know, How many years? a sleeveless shirt. So yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um I oh my goodness. Um I think we're set up now. So we're just gonna go ahead and start. I see that there's Jane is on. Hi, Jane. Hi, Jane. Nice to see you. And we have a couple of others on as well. Um, and it's fine if, you're, if your video is off because some people are calling in. And this is also being recorded. And everybody who signed on will get a, a recording um, of, of this AMA. Um, so welcome. Hi, Jane. It's nice to meet you face to face after uh -huh. our phone calls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so AMA is a, is a, a series that we started some time ago, ask me anything. And it started out as a sort of like, ask me anything. <laughs> and um, which always made my stomach, you know, kind of flip a little before every, I'm like, I don't know what people are going to ask, but it just seemed like um, I like being an open book. And so it created a really nice sort of community. And then we started to, to change the AMAs or, or, or um, sort of add to the, the, the idea of the AMA and sharing the mic. And so now we often have an AMA um, where we invite a guest. And um, last week we had a, a trans woman on and um, several months ago, we had a queer 101 AMA and we had two young women um, coming on and, you know, everyone's just an open book. And it was inspired by um, a project called the Human Library that I think started in Denmark and the human library was uh, or is a, um, a project where events are held and instead of checking out a book, um, you go into the library and check out a person. And so it's a, you know, a large hall and people are sitting at tables and you can actually go and find a person who is the book of um, say being an immigrant or being, being a black woman or um, being uh, someone who's survived cancer. And then you can sit down with that person like sitting down with a book and having a, a dialogue and interaction. So um, they're really precious, our AMAs. And this particular one, of course, is about the Wisdom of Thriving course um, and all of its um, topics associated. So I don't imagine we'll just only talk about the course, but certainly any of the, the topics and themes that are um, covered in the course or anything else that wants to be talked about tonight, given the state of our world um, is sort of uh, open for all of us. And, um, and I will open the floor, um, but wanna introduce a little bit about the Wisdom of Thriving, which is a eight hour, an eight week course. Um, it's two hours every, uh, every week, and we take a deep dive into um, the book Flying Lead Change, 56 Million Years of Wisdom for Living and Leading. And, um, and we just take a real deep dive into some of the, um, or all of the subjects that are raised in the book and engage in more experiential processes around those, um, those things. And it's a very special course, um, this is the fourth time I have done it, and it and it always surprises me what happens at the end. That some I think part of the secret sauce is the learning community that happens um, there in the course. It's usually a sort of intimate group of anywhere between six and twelve people. And what I didn't expect is that you know, we sort of make this journey from through those different tenets of the evolutionary intelligence of the horse. Herd. And the end of the book ends in the chapter of uh, joy. And what seems to happen after every eight week course is a culmination in people actualizing joy in their lives and uh, like really and truly and really making some significant shifts. So 
So it's a special, a very special class. And um, for those of you that are that are just listening to the recording, um, I encourage you to um, definitely write me any questions that you have about it if you're considering joining. And we do keep space limited just because I like to keep the learning community intimate. So um, a few people have written in questions um, about um, not just the wisdom of thriving, but just life <laughs> and I'll, I can feed those in. But because there's just a couple of us here, just if you wouldn't mind just saying hi and where you're from and um, what, your, what your heart is sort of holding right now today. And yeah, anybody, Anne, you wanna start? Sure, sure. Hi everybody, whoops. Um, my name is Anne and uh, I live south of Grand Junction, Colorado in a little tiny town called Whitewater with uh, a, an unusual herd, my husband, <laughs> and three Mustangs, a mule, a donkey, and crazy little dog. And we have um, hard scrabble land that we think is just beautiful. And I uh, read Kelly's book because I listened to Sounds True mm. and Sammy Time, Sorry, sorry, Tammy Simon had interviewed Kelly and I was just mesmerized. I had never heard anybody speak really so eloquently about, uh, for me, matters of extreme importance of the heart and the land and um, how uh, actually, I'm just, I'm putting... Kelly, I, forgive me if I do this, but I, how I interpreted it was this human hubris and arrogance that we have. Uh, that that's how I interpreted the book. And I have felt that since I was a little girl. And uh, I'm, I'm a scientist and uh, not a scholar, but I, I read everything. I love science, but I essentially, um, I work from my gut or heart. And it just really resonated with me. And I've turned so many people onto Kelly's book and, and some of the most unusual hardened cowboys and Vietnam veterans just love it. So just from my little Petri dish, uh, I know that Kelly speaks something that is really needed right now in our world now. And, and um, with everything that's going on. And um, that's why I am here. And I also um, treated myself to uh, uh, a day with Kelly in Santa Fe, I love Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. And um, usually I can't join these, but uh, I had just come in from the corral and I left two that so still glad. need some work. And um, because I just, I really wanted to be here. so. That's me, and it's it's nice. And Jane, I see you, Jane Hemptill. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or, I don't know if we're the only one, but I see you. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> see the sun pouring in here. I never turn on the Zoom with the sun in here, but yeah, yeah. Do you want me to go? Um, yeah, just uh, just since we have a small group, and there's a few more people joining, but their cameras on, on, so we'll we'll just we'll just be in our little small living room together. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can talk and my love bird doesn't start talking over me. Um, but yeah, I'm, um, I'm Jane and I live um, not far from Santa Fe in White Rock, New Mexico. So about 40 minutes from Santa Fe. Um, what's funny about the book too is I did the, um, I have a small like book club group and we um, did the, book, the Flying Lee Change book. It was really fun to go through and hear everybody else's point on it so that's what made me think how cool this course would be to just get a you know a, a group I mean we were only four but uh, um, six to twelve people sound like a nice amount to you know be able to work through because you it is a book you really like to talk through after you mm -hmm. read you really mm -hmm. need to like share it with mm -hmm. people so yeah that's why I showed up <laughs> great great Jane 
Well, welcome. And um, I'll just open the floor if there's anything you, um, either of you or those of you who are sort of muted, silenced, invisible, want to um, put your hand up to ask or to share or to um, engage in some dialogue around the floor is officially open. If something comes up that you would like, you would prefer not to be recorded, please let me know and we'll pause the recording for the duration of that engagement and then we'll turn it back on again. And um, I don't have my glasses on, so um, I just prefer that you just say, hey, and <laughs> we can talk because I'm not gonna see the chat. Uh, it looks too blurry from here. So um, yeah, so I'll just open the floor. There was a, um, a few questions that got sent in um, in advance. Oftentimes people will do that because they don't necessarily feel comfortable. Just, um, you know, people have varying levels of comfort over Zoom. So um, I'll just start there. Um, someone wrote in, in talking about her book entitled Thrive, Ariana Huffington used the simple metaphor um, that when our phone shows a message that it's time to plug in and recharge. We do it, but we don't do that for ourselves. Why do you think it's easier with our devices than, when our, than with ourselves? Um, so we, we cover self-care a lot in this. Uh, self-care tends to be sort of a thread that is running all the time through this course because really and truly in unless we are fully intact and um, taking care of ourselves, it's really hard for us to um, truly engage in the world in this robust way that Flying Lead Change um, encourages us to do. And while I saw this question come in a couple of hours ago and I was thinking about it, um, while I think that's a um, terrific metaphor about plugging the phone in to recharge, <laughs> I don't think it's a fair comparison uh, because, you know, the wiring in our brain that encourages us to attend to our phone in any way, whether it's, you know, scrolling through it or plugging it in so it doesn't go dead, is a completely different wiring than the kind of wiring in our brain it requires to take care of ourselves. So for a phone, there is a kind of addictive pattern with our phones where we get a feel-good hormone boost every single time we answer an email or respond to a text or you know, take care of a task on our phone. And so we're already in a kind of, um, I don't think it overstates it to say we're already in an addictive loop with our phones. Um, and so naturally we want to plug it in because naturally we don't want it to go dead because all you have to do is tell someone their phone is dead for three hours and watch the panic. Um, and we don't go into the same panic when we're feeling tired and exhausted and we need to recharge. Um, that's because it's, it's a different, it's a completely different gestalt. Um, self-care, self-care is not necessarily as rewarding as the things at least from a brain point of view, um, as rewarding as um, you know, watching television or going shopping or texting or messing around on Facebook, all which are designed to ignite the feel-good hormones in our brain to make us want to be on Facebook more than we want to take a walk. Um, and so it's a little bit harder to take care and it's more uncomfortable to take care of ourselves. And also we have to push up against our narratives around selfishness and whether or not we're worth it. And um, there's a really fabulous book. Here I am talking about somebody else's book, but there's a fabulous book called The War of Art. Um, and if you ever, as an artist, have you, you know, that book? That book really kicked my butt. <laughs> it's a little book and it's one of those things you can just read a couple of pages of. But the point of me bringing it up is that um, whenever there's a creative process, whether that's art or a, a good relationship or self-care um, or a really important adventure we need to take, the physics are such that resistance naturally presses up against it. And um, 
And so we have enormous resistance to taking care of ourselves. And we have to understand that and respect that. And if we're expecting that we're not going to have resistance in taking care of ourselves, then we end up in more loops around, well, why is this so hard? And what's wrong with me? And all these secondary emotions and narratives about it that actually create more resistance. So, um, so this is actually the kind of thing that happens in the Wisdom of Thriving course, because we'll... You know, we definitely go into the material in the book, but we end up in all these other tangents as well that are really relevant both to the group and its emergent learning process, but also relevant to the moment we're in and, and what's going on for everyone. Um, and so I guess the other thing I want to highlight just in this question alone around self-care, there's this, the tone of the, the tone of how the question presents Ariana's um, metaphor about like, wow, we can plug in a phone so easily, but we don't take care of ourselves, has this tone of like, what's wrong with us? You know, geez, it's so easy to plug in. The, what's wrong that you can't just, you know, plug in and recharge yourself. And I believe that that tone underlies a mindset, which is part of the problem, which is that there is something wrong with us that we're a problem to be solved. And even if we're trying to take care of ourselves, if we're not doing that right, we're still a problem to be solved. And so a lot of the wisdom of thriving is around, you know, peeling off these layers, many layers that are very um, obviously unhelpful, but there's a lot of layers in our narrative that sort of our wolves in sheep's clothing that appear helpful and, you know, and sound rational and sound like important, but this layer of like, I need to work harder at taking care of myself with that kind of tone of self-recrimination is a completely unuseful layer. Yeah. Does anybody resonate with that or have any comments to say about that particular rant I just had? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, Kelly, I, I completely agree with you, except in the beginning, you said when you look at um, Facebook or you, know, you think you used Instagram, but something, you feel better. I feel terrible mm -hmm. when I look at Facebook or Instagram. I feel awful. And um, so I don't, I don't participate in Facebook anymore, but I do Instagram because some friends that are in foreign countries, that's all that they have access to or they're doing. So mm -hmm. um, very careful. Gosh, I just start comparing myself to other people. And, um, you know, everybody else seems to have such a glamorous life. And they're right. so happy. <laughs> um, they look so good and um, I, it's, and I think, oh, gosh, am I envious or jealous? And I, that's not it. I know that's not it. It's just something in the whole thing there um, makes me feel well, squeamish. It's almost squeamish. It doesn't make me feel bad. It makes me feel squeamish. Yeah. Well, you know, it's I'm a very strange thing. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I, I, you, you know, I applaud and acknowledge your sensitivity that you notice how bad it makes you feel. Um, and m many people are still, you know, like um, prompted or compelled to keep scrolling no matter, it's like watching a train wreck, like no matter how bad they feel, there's still this, there's got to be, it's like the rat not getting the treat but he still pushes the lever because at some point there's going to be a share that makes me feel good or makes me feel validated or makes me feel like I want to respond or whatever. And so that's sort of part of the thing, you know, fortunately for you, you really started to see really its impact on you. Um, and, and for that reason, I do the same and, you know, it's, uh, the impact of social media on our society is um, 
very destructive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Jane, you were nodding when Anne was talking. Yeah, but I'm kind of both. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes I, I mean, I love reading or seeing pictures because I have family all over. So I love seeing the pictures and those stories. But what I've caught myself doing is reading all comments on certain, especially anything political and the comments. And I'm like, why am I reading? Because then I'm feeling exactly what you were talking about. Yeah. Like, and why am I reading though? So now I, like, I'll start reading them. I'm like, uh, uh-uh, I'm out. <laughs> this is because you get sucked into what the next person, then they get battling each other. And I'm like, I'm pulled yeah. into like their battle and yeah. 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 It's a great awareness. And, and me too. I mean, my gateway into Facebook was because I wanted to spy on my kids. I wanted to know what they were doing. And then I, it was the only way I could be in touch with my friends and people Mm -hmm. overseas and things. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's like food. Um, We can't not eat, but there's all kinds of things out there that, Mm -hmm. um, that aren't good for us to eat. And so, you know, their life, totally 100% without social media might not be realistic for some, but how to, you know, Mm -hmm. how to notice how to have enough self awareness that there are certain parts of it you just won't engage with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Somebody else wrote, let me just find it. Um, Okay, I think I'll wait for that one. I'll do that one in a little bit. Life, uh, this is a different one. Life is really getting uh, crazier and crazier, it seems. How can this class assist me not only to survive the current circumstances, but also somehow make a positive difference? Um, so, so I think I think the reason this class can assist with with being the change is that a a lot of the work in the class is experiential and it's about shaping us to be the instrument we need to be in the world uh, to really follow our calling and be our most authentic self. So it's not enough just to cognitively understand a lot of theories. It's about becoming something. And this course does shape us to become something. And I say us because every time I do it, something new emerges for me as well, because I'm participating in the exercises and the homework um, and everything too. Also, you're engaging with 56 million years of evolutionary intelligence. And what is evolutionary intelligence? It's, um, It's the 56 million years, 3.8 billion years of prototyping, 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 you know, making mistakes, trying something new, all of that sort of intelligence that nature does in order to keep perpetuating itself in increasingly intelligent ways. So I heard uh, the other day that of all the species that have ever been on planet earth, Um, of all creatures, all animals, plants, everything, insects, of all of them, 99% are extinct. Mm -hmm. Only 1% remain. Mm -hmm. So that means the 1% are the survivors. You know, all the the plants you see outside, the bugs, the animals, they're the survivors. They're the, what, you know, 3.8 billion years of evolutionary intelligence have produced. And so there is so much intelligence uh, available to us from that, um, from that evolution and from um, all the ways uh, nature has worked, reworked, tried this on for size. And, and there's a social innovation to that as well. So learning from something other than humans, learning from 3.8 billion years or learning from 56 million years is a whole other way to um, not only learn, but then engage in exercises that help shape us to benefit from that evolutionary intelligence. And really, if I think about it, in this age where things really do seem to be in great decline on many levels, then what is being called for is something altogether different than what we could imagine as human beings. So if I were to want, if I were to want to turn to a teacher of sorts to help me, I wouldn't, 
I don't know if I'd want a human teacher. I think I would want a 3.8 billion year old teacher or a 56 million year old teacher. So, so um, I do believe that there is a, that we're being all called in some way, whether it's just being called forward to be more authentic um, mm. or we're being called to be more brave or we're being called to actually do something, some kind of project that makes a difference. But I can imagine that all of you that are on this call today have that sense that something is being asked of you. Um, this was an edgy question. Oh, well, here, I'll go to this easier one. Is there homework and other commitments I need to make time for? Yeah, there's homework um, in between the, the, um, the classes. It's not, I don't task load you, but there, there is homework and this, you know, ex, you know, experiential and, and there's some pairings that I have you do. So you'll, you'll um, be encouraged to make phone call and uh, make a, a phone call or a zoom call with with someone in the class so that you can have some conversation together because my um my desire is to sort of flatten the hierarchy that there's a lot of wisdom to be had with all the people who are in the class as well and when they get together and they speak together and learn together you know outside of the classroom setting a lot of really special things happen um, but the feedback i get is that um the homework is you know, engage is engaged and there is a time thing, but it's not too much. Nobody's complained that it's too much. Um, unlike my assertiveness training for empath course, which is coming up, which is a, a little bit more uh, intense um, for, for reason, for very specific reasons, because usually when you're an empath and you want to learn to be more assertive, you're really gasping for so much air. Um, it's really like, please just I need to change my life. And so we really get you practicing a lot of engagement of assertion. Um, I'm going to pause before I go into any more of the questions. Anybody in the space have anything to share, add, or ask um, so far from what we've discussed? Jane, I'm curious, like when you did the uh, book club, of the flying lead change. Um, oh gosh, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. Is there any, I just would have loved that. Yeah, and they were such that, different yeah, people. Share with me what that was like. All, all of them are such different. That's why those, these, those are so, that was one of the best books because, and I, it's what you're saying. When you bring in other people, then they talk about a part that, you know, I hadn't even thought of or didn't jump out at me but jumped out at them and then they share and I'm like wow and then I have to go back and read that part or hear that part <laughs> I have them both <laughs> uh -huh. so oh there I'm you know right off the, I'll have to think about it for a minute but that that was the big part was just like one of them was an engineer you know and then and they're just all these different um I was trying to think the only woman with one of the women is a horse really, you know, has her horses, has always had horses. The rest of us, are, all our horse stuff are lived through her or other people. So mm -hmm. it was just, um, yeah, I think everyone enjoyed it, you know, and, and like I said, brought different, mm -hmm. um, different things to it. So it was, was there any, was there any perspective that like surprised you that you can think of? Um, Yeah, I'd have I'd have to think about it. That would have been a good one for me to to even look at notes because, mm -hmm. um, yes, they did. But right off the bat, I can't think. But um, yeah, I just I remember because it's like a body member, so I'm remembering yes. being yes. so like um, you know, we laughed. We it was just like so much. Um, it just it was just a really good fun thing for a group. So that's yeah. again why I thought this would be really um yeah yeah and the community you know just bringing a group together and then all the different points of view and mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. great thank you um you just said something a second ago the body memory mm -hmm. and um i'm glad you brought that up because that's definitely something that you know we engage with a lot because of so 
in learning, especially it's so easy to just learn from the sort of from the nose up. <laughs> and um, there's a whole lot of somatics in the course and inquiry into where wisdom's showing up in the body and, uh, and tracking our bodies and tracking our body's language and what it's saying and what it's remembering and, um, and, and making that just as relevant as some of the cognitive conversations that our, our minds and our mouths might have. Um, and so people um, start to return to themselves in a way that they hadn't before necessarily, or return also to, through their bodies, a connection to place. Um, there was someone who was in the last course who had immigrated here from the UK and um, she, and she, her body just was not feeling at home. Um, in fact, she was in the desert and she's from the UK and, and it was hard. And it was um, first for her to just have an awareness about that um, was important because without that awareness, there was a kind of free floating depression going on mm -hmm. um, because something was askew, but she didn't know what it was. And that askewness, that kind of, um, uh, lack of congruence was enough over time to create depression. As soon as she was able to acknowledge that she really felt out of place, that she did, she felt on top of the earth instead of sort of in belonging to the place where she had moved to, then her depression sort of lifted, which was a, a funny paradox that in acknowledging that she doesn't feel a sense of belonging which is a kind of, one would say a negative state that the depression actually lifted because that, that knowledge liberated her because from there she could then look at how she could connect to place. And again, all of that's through body, right? It's our, it's our body that feels those things. Um, okay, Roe versus Wade, what would Artemis do? <laughs> um, so I have an essay coming out uh, uh, probably next week. In the book, both of you will remember that story about how Brio, our Lusitano, he was this new horse that had been raised by stallions. Remember that story? And he kind of goes into the herd and he's like, Rah, like Godzilla. And he's, he has no, and what often happens with domesticated horses is they have not been trained the natural way. So oftentimes you can have horses who are very badly behaved and do not understand the, you know, those seven tenets of safety, connection, peace, freedom, and joy, because they also have been colonized, right? And Brio was definitely a product of that because he was part of a breeding barn and he was, you know, with stallions and he'd never had the discipline of a mare. And so there's just so many parallels to that story. I mean, I can think of so many brios in the world right now. Uh, but, you know, of course, what was interesting was she, you know, she couldn't depart from her fidelity, which is those seven tenets. So she couldn't win back her power through his style she couldn't write and so in a way we're kind of in a similar circumstance how do we make change in the world in a world that's kind of inherently insane um that doesn't recognize equality that you know that keeps hierarchy violently in place um and so artemis in the end didn't, I was thinking about it in writing this essay, she didn't fight for her power in his world. She changed the world. <laughs> she, she, changed the, she changed the mindset. She completely just held on to, you know, the, the, the herd, the normal herd world. And and did that rather than engaging in Brio's world and trying to fight within that kind of structure with those rules. So how do we do that? You know, how do we, if you think about it, and this is just my opinion, 
to fight for equality inside a patriarchy is is almost insane because patriarchy can't see equality. It's just, it doesn't operate absent inequality. And so you can't make something happen inside a system that won't let that happen. So, you know, so I think about Artemis, I think about 56 million years of evolutionary intelligence, what would it do? And it has something to do, I think, with holding a vision of, of a completely and utterly different world, a different narrative, a different set of rules a, that would appear completely irrational to the patriarchal mindset. And that is probably done through very uncomfortable conversations mm -hmm. with all the people in our life, um, which I've personally decided to do. So there are a lot of decent people who are, who may say something like, oh, well, but what could we do anyway? Or it doesn't really affect me or, and so in, instead of kind of turning away from those conversations, I'm turning and leaning into the discomfort of having a very uncomfortable conversation with them. And what's inspired me to do that is, um, well, Emmanuel Acho with his uncomfortable conversations with a black man, which is very inspiring. If you haven't seen that, oh, wonderful, wonderful video, wonderful book, wonderful YouTube um, episodes. Um, and also my daughter who engaged with me for a period of time with many uncomfortable conversations when she was really lifting up my implicit biases, my racism, my sexism, my stereotype thinking and narratives that I didn't realize I was doing. I thought I was such a, you know, intelligent progressive. <laughs> and she's like, mom, <laughs> and she's like going in there and with respect and kindness, but she wouldn't let up and it was uncomfortable and, and not fun at times. But on the other side of it, I'm really grateful because I do feel like I'm in a different world now, completely different world. So, um, and to talk to our young people about voting, um, cause a lot of them have checked out and they don't want to vote. And we need to have uncomfortable conversations with our young people about why it's important to vote and why it makes a difference. And so I think we're being called to be intelligent about what we're talking about and to have our facts straight and to lean into uncomfortable conversations. And, you know, I had an uncomfortable conversation with my farrier and with my tra horse trainer and my <laughs> dear friend who's a decent guy, but, you know, there's just some things. And so that's, I think, how we do it. I agree, Kelly. And um, I just wanted to tag on with what Jane said about you, you had a book group. I, I wish I could have been there. Um, I didn't do anything like that, but I, as I mentioned, I mentioned the book to so many people and I'm on a board, a very unusual board. It's um, a group of veterans um, that are making this incredible art project in Boulder, not, not where I am. Mm -hmm. And um, it's called Warrior Story Field. And uh, it's spearheaded by a 70 something year old um, artist who's not a veteran. He was a conscientious objector to the Vietnam War. So he's working with um, Vietnam War. There's no World War II, but there's Vietnam War and Afghan, you know, all the subsequent. Mm -hmm. um, the project is so magnificent is the most beautiful thing I've ever witnessed. And they want it to be a sanctuary. It's a, um, a dragon of war on one side and a uh, phoenix of resurrection on the other. Um, and in the middle is a sanctuary of healing where stories are told in, in these these veterans and veterans families that, that you know, they're very inclusive, but um, I've helped them keep on track that 
we don't need to be that inclusive. It's about you guys right now. I mean, you can you can include your families and such because um, uh, the the fellow that's running the project is an empath to the nth degree. The con conscientious objector, and he was being overrun by all of these mostly men. Um, veterans and a lot of them were people coming in that weren't veterans that wanted to hijack this incredible project to do jujitsu training or um, let's do the Marshall Fire in Boulder and it was just getting pulled in everywhere by by this um, this impact that's trying to hold it together and Kelly. Um, Another board member who's a Vietnam War veteran that's a very dear friend of mine, terrible PTSD, but he read your book and he said it's the best book he's ever read and everybody on the board has read the book. And mm -hmm. um, Robert, the empath, was able to say, you know what? I can be Artemis. I'm a human male, but I really relate to her. And he yeah. said, I can be Artemis. And it, it just, I don't have to get in there swinging my fists. And um, I, can, I can just let the time take it along with, with the help of the herd, which mm -hmm. is yet four board members. But I just wanted to mention that because I thought, oh, I'm so envious that Jane had this wonderful book club. And <laughs> I had a book club with my board. Although we didn't discuss the book, we discussed it in the board. And Kelly, that book has helped us get through um, some, some really trying times. It helped Robert and helped Bob, who is a horseman. My friend who's on the board is a veteran. He was at Hamburger Hill. He just saw horrible things. And um, he is helping Robert get through this. Uh, by following the direction and instruction of Artemis, you know, pulling her in from the ethers, from what we've, we've constructed about her. And um, so I, I don't know if you realize, Kelly, how powerful and the tentacles going, it's reaching the right people. And they're not the type of people that are going to come back to you and say, mm -hmm. hey, that really helped me. They're not going to do that. Yeah. That, I love they're, hearing that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I love this thing, like a man can be Artemis too. It makes me want to write another yes. essay. Yeah. Very. <laughs> right? um, because it's true because we're not talking women. We're talking right. the feminine, right? The ancient feminine, which we all, all genders have. Mm -hmm. And so I just love, love, love that he said that. And when we, as women or men who resonate with that Artemis mm -hmm. alpha nature and we invite others to that as well um I believe this is a really powerful thing so I just love that so much mm -hmm. and I think that's going to help us through all these um things that are going on in the world yeah. um what you were talking about Roe versus Wade Ukraine, all this stuff is just in our face about mm -hmm. you all do this and I'm doing this and just stepping all over. And Brio is such a beautiful guy. He is a beautiful guy. <laughs> and I think uh, we can sort of, if we can keep our hearts in that open, it's like just be Artemis. And there are a lot of beautiful um, guys and gals that have uh, an energy that is very, it can be very destructive and mm -hmm. just know that there's a way through it. There is. And you oh, know, he wasn't, he wasn't cast out. No, he wasn't called out. He didn't, no one it kicks him in work. the work, you know, and now he's, and he, but he found his way to a place he couldn't have found by himself. Mm -hmm. And, and you'll be happy to know, and that, you know, he is happier and happier and more and more sort of sparkly and more sweet. And he, he's very protective of the donkey and oh, I'm so <laughs> he's really found his place. Uh -huh. 
and 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 everyone likes him meaning the other horses of course everyone loves brio but all the horses like him and um and the guys are trying to provoke him to play more and be less serious and so it's just so so beautiful to see that artemis's victory didn't come at a cost to brio at all i mean it came you know to his his uh, betterment for sure so yeah it's a great such a great teaching story the artemis story yeah yeah great um, let's see if there's anything else. Ha, ha, ha. Um, I think we've covered a lot already. So I think what I'll do is if, unless there's anything else anybody wants to bring um, into the space or share or, or, uh, or ask, we'll just start to close up our circle for tonight. Um, I was just going to touch on what you said Kelly about daughter because I have four daughters but <laughs> my 23 year old is because I don't like confrontation so I usually keep my opinions to myself and she goes you know if you don't speak up you're actually part of the problem <laughs> I'm like oh man it's nothing like we raise all these kids and then <laughs> like they're our best teachers <laughs> like, uh, like totally. okay, okay. <laughs> like I said I may lose a few people but okay <laughs> yes oh what a lovely loving empowering thing for your daughter to say yeah awesome. oh yeah. yeah yeah and she said it she did say it kindly I mean it wasn't like you know hand on hip like when she was three yeah it was right. kind of like a, you know just yeah. and it made me think of yes yeah, so many of us like you were saying just say well it doesn't affect me or you know it'll blow over all these things instead of speaking up because we've all been taught to don't rock the boat, you know, yes. kind of thing. And now this boat needs rocking, I guess. Yes, so. <laughs> yes, yes. I, yes. So I encourage all of us to mm -hmm. lean in, lean into those uncomfortable conversations. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Well, thank you both for just being so generous with your presence <laughs> in this, in this time together. And, um, oh my gosh, you've inspired me, Jane. I want to like have book clubs everywhere. I know. And that it really was the, but that's why I thought this would be so cool. This class you were talking about, but I so enjoyed that. Yeah. You know, doing that yeah. book club. Great. Yep. We'll have a beautiful evening and yeah. thank you for all that you do and the presence that you bring both of you and just, yeah, we'll yeah. see you when we see you again. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Nice to meet you, Jane. Yes. Bye. Nice to meet you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.